Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Lucy, you got a lot of explaining to do edition of the Jim Cornette experience. I am Jim Cornette. At least I am for right now. Who knows? I may have hit men looking for me uh, on today's program. I've got most of my voice back, and just in time, we're going to talk about last night's episode of the Viceland documentary series, Dark Side of the Ring, on Vice TV, and my involvement in it. We're also going to talk about uh, my weekend in West Virginia, uh, who Stephen P. New is going to sue next, uh, the Crockett Cup coming up, all kinds of stuff. I'm glad to be back on a regularly scheduled basis, and to join me in this, my cohort and co-host... Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, Swammy's Pappy, the post office playboy, Susie's favorite boy, the proprietor of the French Toast Chateau, your friend and mine, the podcasting guru of Arcadian Vanguard himself, the great Brian Last. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to hear you in good spirits once again. You sound at 75%, 85% back to normal. I was, I was going to give it 85. I've still got a little, you know, but it's it's getting better because I lost it in West Virginia again after doing that program last week. Then went to uh, to <laughs> Madison, West Virginia for the All Star <laughs> Wrestling event. I understand it's a popular phrase over there. I lost it in West Virginia again. Hey, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now. Anyway, um, no, but but last week's episode, even though I sounded a little rough because I'd lost my voice doing the MLW uh, marathon announcing the week before we were late with it. And it as a result, I, I guess has broken is just breaking records for downloads for YouTube listens on official Jim Cornette on YouTube, uh, proving the old theory. How can I miss you? If you won't go away, we went away for a few days, people missed us and they couldn't wait. Yeah. I don't know. I think they would have been there if we were on time. Uh, well, just shit on everything I come up with today. <laughs> I'm trying to be cheerful here. Um, they were excited. They were excited to hear your take, not just on WrestleMania, but on whenever it's a travel story, whenever it's Jim Cornette on the road, they know there's going to be something that's entertaining. Oh, good gosh. Well, and this past weekend, I was back on the road again immediately after we did that program. Uh, I went over to uh, suburban Charleston, West Virginia, Madison, West Virginia, to, for All-Star Wrestling's uh, 14th anniversary event where they were – inducting myself in the Midnight Express in the Hall of Fame. And that was a long day, too, once again. And not just working, visiting with the Midnight Express and Bobby Fulton. Uh, John Fell came down. Tracy Smothers was there. I hadn't got a chance to talk to him in a long time. Stephen P. New was bounding around all over the place with his legal cohorts and got a chance to... So it was a lot of talking and visiting as well as the the event that night. I lost my voice again because... Not only did we accept, obviously, the Hall of Fame induction, and of course, I uh, did an interview with uh, Bobby Fulton and Tracy Smothers and Stephen P. New and Brian Logan there, who was the referee for the Legends match, and that uh, Tracy got a little ticked off, I guess, and that went south. Um, yeah, what's the we, story? Hold on, Jim. Someone told me something. Did Tracy Smothers smash up a, a little girl's artwork of Tracy Smothers? Is that well? Correct? No, no, it, not quite. Um, well, kind of, but not. That's not all. <laughs> Um, what happened was uh, Tracy was uh, booked in the legends match against Bobby Fulton with Brian Logan, the, the referee and Stephen P new was there with proclamations for, for all three men on behalf of the, the state of West Virginia and the wrestling fans of West Virginia for their contributions to wrestling over the years. And he also, his beautiful daughter, Rebecca, I think she's 16, but she was in art class <clears throat> and she, uh, uh, in the style, I believe of, I think he said it was Bob's burgers, uh, the art, the uh, animation style they have that. I don't know what he was saying, but I don't watch the Bob's burgers program, but, but anyway, she did nice paintings, portraits on this big canvas of Tracy Smothers and Bobby Fulton. And I thought they were very nice for, for a young girl to do, but Tracy got upset because when he got in the ring, I guess he was mad because the Midnight Express got inducted in the Hall of Fame. And we got plaques, and all he was, all he got, as he mentioned, was some shitty proclamation. <laughs> and and I felt like, no, now come on, now this was a serious thing here, and and I was upset because you know it was so far. Brian had spoken nice to his home state crowd, and then Bobby Fulton had said that you know that he he really appreciated the honor, and it was great, and he loved it, and that. 
he loves wrestling for the fans. And that's why he still does it. Not as much as he used to, but you know, cause he's had problems as when he talked about on the program, when he was on here he has he, he has lost a sight in one of his eyes. And so he only wrestles intermittently and, but he just loves it and he's tried to retire. But anyway, when Tracy came in, he, he took issue with Stephen P. New. He thought that he might be the crooked lawyer that I used to close down Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And why did he just get a shitty proclamation? And I said, but Tracy, you got this beautiful portrait, this, this young girl. She's standing on the apron of the ring. I said, you got this beautiful portrait this young girl has done of you. And he said, well, let me tell you what I think of that. And he grabbed it and he punched through it. And when he punched through it, that's when Bobby Fulton got upset, and he he went up to say something to Tracy, and Tracy asked him, now, Bobby, before we have this match, which one is your bad eye? And Bobby said, well, this one over here. So Tracy then poked him in his good one. <laughs> and that and that just, and now you've gone too far. To poke a one-eyed man in his good eye, and, and then me and Steven, we jumped out of the ring, and Tracy Smothers took the, the portrait, and this was what was just most shocking and just disheartening. Tracy took the portrait that young Rebecca knew had done of Bobby Fulton and broke it over Bobby's head. Oh, it, I, come actually, on. Didn't, <laughs> he didn't break it over Bobby's head. He, 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 he bashed it over Bobby's head and the frame didn't break, but the portrait did. And it stuck over Bobby's head. So Bobby looked like <laughs> that he had a little bitty body because his head was sticking through. And then you can see the rest. Of it. I don't and mean to was, laugh. I don't mean to laugh. It's the, well, it's you shouldn't situation. laugh here. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very serious situation, but anyway, then uh, Tracy began going for Bobby's good eye and referee Brian Logan at that point had had all he could stand. He couldn't stand anymore. And he went to pull Tracy off of him and Tracy turned around and they, and just knocked Brian Logan colder than a banker's heart. And at that point I got up on the apron of the ring to try to plead with Tracy to reconsider what he was doing. And when he actually snatched me, he snapped cause he had lost, he just lost control of himself. He snatched me. Luckily, Bobby Fulton, with the painting still on his head, came from behind, and and as he grabbed Tracy's legs, I was able to shove Tracy away from me. He fell backwards over Bobby Fulton, and wouldn't you know who won the pony? Stephen P. New was right there to make the count. Well, One, two, go. three. <laughs> so we got we got legal justice done. Stephen, not only does Stephen P. New take down the big corporations and the people who would do us harm, but he he brings justice to the wrestling ring. So, as if you need to sue, call Stephen P. New. What's that number, Brian? 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen. Jim, I, I know there's been so many hardcore matches, and I have to imagine there aren't too many that ended with a painting over the, the guy pinning the other guy's head. Well, no, and this was supposed to be a good, clean, scientific match, is what the, the, the thing was. It wasn't even a hardcore match. It was a legends match. And Tracy just went, he just went haywire. So, but anyway, it worked out at the end. Not, not to push the issue at all, but obviously Stephen was there with a lot of other lawyers. He's big in the community, but is Stephen a licensed referee by the state of West Virginia? They might overturn the decision. Anyway, um, <laughs> and for those of you wondering, yes, I will be. Uh, until I drop, I will be making all of my commitments. Uh, the Cornette's collectibles orders are out at jimcornette.com. If you've ordered in the last week or so, all that's been mailed off as you hear this, uh, uh merchandise still available, of course, at Cornette's collectibles at jimcornette.com. The outlaw mud show shirts are, are even t-shirts are even more popular than ever, but, uh, big news as a matter of fact on merchandise that we will have in the next couple weeks, but also. I'm going to be making all my commitments, uh, including April 27th in Concord, North Carolina, suburban Charlotte at the Cabarrus Arena for the Crockett Cup, the NWA Ring of Honor co-promotion of the 2019 Crockett Cup Tag Team Tournament. As well, the NWA title will be defended Nick Aldis and Marty Skrull, the NWA Women's Championship, just a variety of championships. And, of course, the Crockett Cup Tournament and... A VIP uh, experience, since that's popular these days, uh, all day on Saturday the 27th, you can meet the Midnight Express, both Bobby Eaton, Stan Lane, and Dennis Condry. Well, not both, all three, as well as myself, the Rock and Roll Express, Magnum TA, Nikita Koloff, Tommy Young will be there. 
uh, we're got Billy Corgan will be there involved in a panel discussion. We're going to do photo ops, meet and greets, the whole nine yards, and then the event that night. And as I mentioned last week, the first round brackets, uh, the Rock and Roll Express are have entered the Crockett Cup and are competing in the first round. If they win it, they'll have to fight three times that night. The first round against the Briscoe brothers, Mark and Jay Briscoe from Ring of Honor. And I mentioned this last week. I think it's a great feel good moment that the Rock and Roll, besides five times NWA World Champ Tag Team Champions, besides dozens of regional titles, being a team that's competed together in four different decades, they've done stuff nobody else has done. But to get in, they had a great showing against LAX WrestleMania weekend, and they're feeling cocky. But I know the Briscoes, and the Briscoes don't do feel good moments, and I am questioning Ricky Roberts' decision on this. But I'll be there to call it. Hopefully, they won't be calling an ambulance at the same time because I know what the Briscoes are capable of as well as I know what the rock and roll is capable of. So, Anyway, we're going to find out what happens April 27th at the Crockett Cup and then May 18th in Richmond, Virginia at the uh, beautiful Holiday Inn, the two-man power trip convention three. Uh, We're not only going to be doing a fan fest uh, with all of the members of the Midnight Express plus more, but also I'll be doing a VIP right afterwards, sometime mid-afternoon, 3, 4 o'clock, as I recall. For a few hours, we're going to have pizza, hang out, tell stories. That's a separately ticketed event, but you can get tickets to everything. Just go to jimcornett.com, click on events and appearances. It'll take you to their their uh, website link, and you can go from there. And what am I leaving out that I'm doing of all these things? Oh, MLW, Saturday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern on BN Sports. You can hear me and Rich Bikini call the action And I will be at the next MLW taping on June 1st in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, And I'll be doing a meet and greet as well as commentary. And it's only one day, so I should be able to keep my voice. Thank heavens. Uh, No more two days in a row for me. I can't do it twice in a row anymore, Brian. It's a shame. You're getting old. But, well, you know, I'll just do it right the first time and won't have to do it twice in a row. Anyway, um... (laughs) And real quick, before we go to the uh, your your information and the rest of our show, I just, I watched the news, obviously the live feed of the fire, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it properly, the Notre Dame Cathedral. That's how I would say it here and not sound like an idiot trying to put on a French accent. But some people actually say, well, Cornette, you ought to be happy the church is burning. No, a modern church, this fucking abortion of an ugly church built 15 years ago that seats 6,000 people over here not far from my house, I'd be happy to see that thing burn because it's an eyesore. But this was one of the great buildings ever created on earth. And it, 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 you don't expect people of that time period, of the Middle Ages. They started building this thing in 1160, I think. Um, You don't expect them to know what's going on. Science... And to have the the advantages and the, the resources that we do today to basically shoot a hole in this whole invisible supreme being myth. But the, the Notre Dame Cathedral is like the pyramid. It's like all the, the Eiffel Tower. It's like all the great buildings down through history. It, it is an example of what human beings could do. What their intelligence and their ingenuity, when they're motivated, can do and can, can conceive of and can accomplish And everybody knows I love antique. When I was over in the UK, I was amazed at the architecture and, and the buildings. And, you know, we talked about it on the program, those buildings that were a thousand years old, that were bigger than anything that we had in the state of Kentucky till the 1900s. Uh, You know, they're, they're just so far ahead of, of the United States in general, but in a lot of cases, you know, the world, in European architecture, it just, it's so, it broke my heart that it, it's, it's like when you cut down the, the, the redwood forests, you'll never get them back. You'll never see them. Humankind may never see them again. When you, when you destroy natural resources, when something like this is destroyed, you can renovate it, but you can't ever get it back. And at least they saved a lot of the priceless art objects and the stained glass sculpture. And once again, regardless of whether, you know, you believe in the whole religion thing or not, these are one-of-a-kind 
art objects that were created hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And it's, it's just, it's a shame to see something like that go, but it, <laughs> here's the goddamn thing. And here's how it applies to the United States, our infrastructure, our bridges, our roads, our tunnels, our buildings. They were in the middle of a, re a, a renovation project on Notre Dame. The renovation project is probably what caused the fire. But the renovation project was like a $7 million job that they were doing. And they needed to do it for decades. They had been talking about how the Notre Dame Cathedral is crumbling in plain sight for decades. And they were doing fundraisers and nobody would get behind it. And nobody, on a mainstream basis, on a big time basis, obviously $7 million, right? And they had to raise that. Now that something like this has happened and everybody's in shock, the billionaires in France are donating hundreds of millions of dollars. People are dead. They've raised 700 million fucking dollars or whatever, right? To try, if they'd have just done this 30 years ago, this wouldn't have happened. So what else do we have to lose before people realize that this is... It's 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 living history. It's history that you can go up and look at. It's it's the state of the art for whatever time that these things were manufactured or made or built. State of the art human intelligence and ingenuity. Whether it be the churches and the cathedrals or the pyramids or the Sphinx or the great buildings, and what in Washington, Washington Monument, Lincoln Memorial, the White House we know has a bunch of rats in it. So, you know, what are we going to lose? What what are we not taking care of? Because, once again, the fucking chief rat in the White House is is making sure that all the corporations have all the money to destroy the goddamn natural resources and, destroy, and strip mine and coal. Like, coal is ever going to be a fucking thing again and shouldn't be, right? But how much are we going to dig up or destroy or leave to ruin or crumble or rot or burn or whatever? This should be a lesson for the whole world. We need to preserve these things and keep these things. Because I think it was more, it was really when you think about it in, in the year 1100 something, it was more of a big deal to build the Notre Dame Cathedral or in 2000 BC or whatever, a bigger deal to build the pyramid in relation to the rest of the human race than it was to go to the fucking moon in 1969. We have to show what people can do when they were motivated. And just, unfortunately, most of the time for these huge monuments in days gone by, it was religion that was motivating them. But still, it was human beings that did it. They invented it, they conceived of it, they thought, of, thought it up, and they executed it. And we need to keep that shit. What have you thought up and executed for this week? Motivating people, thinking up and executing another fun action pack week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. That was the worst segue that you could have possibly. Well, goddamn, I'm still getting back in the swing of things. All right. I'm just a little croupy still, and I'm just I'm I'm verklempt. That I got people with heavy machinery digging French drains in my yard Ooh, the worst. as we speak now. So i you know, it's just it's it's one thing after another. So it just figure that I did a good segue and tell us what the fuck you're doing on your programming. First Notre Dame, now the French drain. Awful. But anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> damn French. <laughs> this week on the Arcadian. By Vanguard the way, did, did by the way, did you see just one other thing? Yeah. Fucking moron, fucking dipshit, president pig fucker. It tweets, well, why don't they drop water from water tanker, flying water tankers on this fucking thing, right? He'll tell them how to save the Notre Dame Cathedral. Yeah. And the French fucking fire department actually tweeted back in English, everything that's being done or that can be done is being done. But if we used flying water tankers, it would cause the entire structure to collapse from above. You fucking idiot. They didn't put that fucking idiot in there. But it, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, the French make just it act, sound much more nasty. <laughs> you just just act like I didn't interrupt and just just go ahead. Well, this week... The I'm last thing I'd want to do is interrupt you when you're trying to do your plugs. I want to make sure that people know what you're doing on your programs this week. This week on... Oh, so I'll just be over here. <laughs> you asshole. <laughs> this week on Rod Fuller's Studcast, 
we continue our look at February 1975 in Southeastern Wrestling. A really interesting time. Ron starts running Johnson City in Kingsport. He's working with Christine and Jerry Jarrett. He's making appearances in Memphis right around the time that Jerry Lawler disappears from Memphis. Yep. There's... And Louisville. And Louisville. And he was Louisville. on Louisville on Tuesdays. That's right. He, he still regrets going there. But we talked about all of that <laughs> and so much more at fullerpod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcasts. I also want to mention this week, I'm breaking kayfabe with Bowdrin and Barry. The boys talk about a number of topics, including hot angles and championship wrestling in Florida, Japanese wrestling matches, and favorite Gene Hackman films. Hear more at baldrinpod.com. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! <laughs> 75%. That's the thing. <laughs> this, uh, I said it last time that the show was in production. Now I'm finally done with my fucking taxes. It really <laughs> is close to coming out. We have a great action packed show what? with. It's coming out? What is it? A gay, gay pride show? This show is coming out, coming out with Jody Simon, the son of the great Malenko. Of course, you know him as Joe Malenko. Jeff Otto on the follow up to Lords of the Ring, Ringmasters, the Great American Bash, 1985. More classic audio and much more. And Jim, I mentioned last time that we play more funny audio. You know, it's one of the things that we do on the Super Podcast. We find something that emerges and it's so ridiculous. Or protrudes, protrudes. as the case may be. And it's so ridiculous that we play it over and over again because we're endlessly fascinated by it. I'm gonna well, is there, is there any way that you could give us a little sample of what you mean, Brian? No. <laughs> no, there is a way. I, I could do that. I will right now. This is a little example. I'm not going to tell you. You don't know what it is. For the listeners at home, he does not know what this is. I do not. You'll hear why this is so ridiculous. We had to play it. I'll play it. If you want me to stop, you could say stop at some point. But this is one of the things we play on this week's Super Podcast. Update takes another look at some of the celebrities for WrestleMania 2. The irrepressible Joan Rivers. Olympic boxing coach Lou Duva. The elusive burger man Herb. Former world boxing champion Smoking Joe Frazier. TV's diminutive old-fashioned lady Claire Pella. Radiant actress Susan St. James. The enigmatic yet resolute G. Gordon Liddy. Brilliant <laughs> young actor Ricky Schroeder. Chocolate Thunder Daryl Dawkins, Cotton Club's incomparable Cab Calloway, shapely and beautiful Kathy Lee Crosby, slightly evil but immensely intriguing Elvira, musician and singer extraordinaire Ray Charles, television superstar Robert Conrad, football's all-time great Dick Butkus, the eerie but explosive rock star Ozzy Osbourne, and now this from our newest celebrity. Hi, everybody. I'm Tommy Lasorda. In Los <laughs> Angeles on April the 7th at the Sports Arena, I will be the ring announcer for the great match between Hulk Hogan and King Kong Bundy. Be there. You're going to really enjoy it. WrestleMania 2 will undoubtedly be professional wrestling's biggest ever extravaganza. For update, this is Lord Alfred Hayes. Well, there you go. More oh, action oh my like that. God. Hey, well, no. <laughs> what a fucking cacophony of fucking D list. <laughs> Cab Calloway was there. I did not know Cab Calloway was at WrestleMania 2. Well, the funny thing, too, is it's 1986. It's not just Cab Calloway, it's the Cotton Club's Cab Calloway. <laughs> In 1986, the Cotton Club's Cab Calloway. Because they hadn't done the movie yet. <laughs> well, actually, it was around the same time, I guess. Well, maybe maybe they were talking about that. But they had not only Herb from the Burger King commercials, <laughs> but Claire P Clara Peller, who was the Where's the Beef Wendy's woman. And that Herb was like a fucking nerd dressed up in, in, in high waters, as we used to call them, and the goofy glasses and the fucking checkered shirt with the pocket protector. And they, they were actually using fast fast food advertising celebrities as celebrities at WrestleMania back then. WrestleMania won. You had Liberace, Muhammad Ali, Cindy Lauper at the height of her yes. powers. Yes. WrestleMania Can't... two, you have elusive Burger Man. Her. Yeah. <laughs> Because that was the deal in the commercials. He kept popping up, or they couldn't find him, or something or other, whatever the fuck. And then, so and Susan St. James was was married to Dick Ebersol, right? Who That's was right. 
the Saturday night's main event guy because he was the NBC programmer. So they got Susan St. James because she was married to the right guy. What if they didn't have the celebrity pulling power back then in the WWF that they do in today's modern WWE where they can have unknown rappers take up time at WrestleMania and things? Can you imagine like Joan Rivers shows up to the Nassau Coliseum like, <laughs> okay, who am I here with? Who am I working with tonight? Joan, this is Herb. <laughs> this, is, this is the old fashioned burger lady, Clara. <laughs> it's here's Cab Calloway and Susan St. James. <laughs> And fucking, oh my God. Well, obviously you can hear more of this type of audio if that's the type of thing you like. For the kind of people who like that kind of thing, that's the kind of thing you people are going to like. And you can hear it at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast. Just search for the 605 Super Podcast. It's also known as The Mothership. And what we are going to do now is we are going to play about five to seven seconds of intermission music because, folks, what we're doing here is we have taped this earlier in the day on Wednesday, and then we're going to break, and we're going to watch the Viceland Dark Side of the Ring episode tonight on the Montreal Screw Job, and then reconvene, Brian and I, and record the rest of this program. See, I've exposed the business. I've exposed our business here, and and if you watch this Montreal Screwjob episode, it will expose more of the business, if that's even possible. Wow, in one and calendar we'll, day, you expose the business on audio, <laughs> on TV. <laughs> <laughs> and But you'll never miss us, folks. We're only going to be gone for a few seconds, and we'll be back, and I'll probably sound hoarser because i got to scream at the people painting my fence later today. And uh, we'll be back and talk about the dark side of the ring. Man, that didn't even seem like nine hours. Well, you're going to be able to tell probably because my voice is nine hours older. But okay, we're back, folks. And we have watched the program. And I'm going to try to get all the details in that they didn't have time for. And here's the thing. It was a 45-minute television show. It couldn't be covered like the Kennedy assassination. You can't do the Warren Commission report in 45 minutes. So everybody's going to go, all the wrestling fans are going to go. But there's so many details they left out and the blah, blah, blah. But for, once again, this is for mainstream consumption. You know, they hit the high points. But obviously, I have some splaining to do. And actually, there's more details than were revealed in the program. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the show here. And we could do three hours if I had the voice. Uh, But basically, I don't think a lot of people understand how the creative team worked with Vince McMahon. Um, During 1996, it was me and Bruce. Right? I've told those stories. We used to play with his dog at his house, wait for Vince to tell us what to do. Uh, But we were still booking wrestling. And then in February 97, two things happened, really in the same week, that both impacted this match. One was Shawn Michaels losing his smile, right? Remember that? Where he came out on Raw and gave the title away, said, I've lost my smile, career-ending knee injury, right? Yes. We, we we had been told by Vince on the phone, well, Sean has a career-ending knee injury. He had been told on the phone by Sean, and we were told at a writing session the next day or whatever. And it, it, so it, it, Bret Hart had taken off in 96. He had put Sean over for the belt, and he'd taken a year off. He was going to do the Lonesome Dove TV show, which he did. And more importantly, he was going to watch Sean Michaels self-destruct as WWF champion, which he was. Not physically, but mentally, whether it be the pills or whether it be the, that they've admitted or whether it be the fucking juvenile behavior or then he's lost his smile, career ending injury, which lasted a couple months. And then he came back. Right. And blah, blah, blah. I, I was even thinking about business wise. It was self-destruct in terms of the house shows went down. Well, the yes. Went down. Yeah. And he wasn't as bad as Diesel, Sean, at the box office. But, you know, who was nobody. Well. But um. But at the same time in February 97, and I looked this up because I wanted to make sure I was in the right place. Uh, And, you know, I got all my books here. Um, I'm looking in my book. It was the Raw on February 26th because that was the Raw where they were some in Germany and some in the studio. You remember this, right? The uh, the all-time worst rated Raw. Yes, yes. And the way that that everybody had sold Vince on this was, oh, it'll show the global reach of the WWF that we're in the studio in Stamford with Stone Cold Steve Austin, but the tour's in Germany, and we're seeing this European title match with Davey Boy and Owen, 
And, you know, we're just, it's all live and it's, it's just global, right? What it was, was the shits. <clears throat> because when there's Bischoff and WCW on the other channel blowing everything up with Pyro and all the big stars and a major arena all lit up, Germany turned out to be a production nightmare. It was dark as shit. It looked like an old outlaw, you know, house show match. But then it was a disjointed television program because we're in the studio in Stamford where Stone Cold's doing a promo, but then somebody's on the phone with Vince and you see a headshot and it was just a lousy TV show. And, and it obviously wasn't my idea to go do goddamn raw from Berlin. Right. So no ap apologies, you know, no offense to the fucking Berliners. So the next day, that's when Vince calls the meeting and he's mad at everybody, regardless whether they had anything to do with it or not. And he brings in the one guy who didn't have anything to do with it, Vince Russo. And that's how Russo got on the creative team. Cause he, hey, he's got all these ideas, pal, and he's writing the stuff in the magazine. So anyway, that's how we got saddled with Vince Russo. So 1997 became a year of misery for me because not only were we trying to be, and it was Bruce and me and Russo, and most of the time now we're going to the office, but we go every Wednesday to Vince's house to write. And that's back still when it was before the monthly pay-per-views. So we were, you know, we had several weeks to come up with shit, and then you do the tapings in a lump. But whereas Bruce and I got along fine, because like I said, at least we were still doing wrestling. It quickly became that Russo did not understand how this shit worked, didn't want to know, didn't give a fuck about finding out, wanted to write the whole thing like Jerry Springer and expose everything and make everything, you know, goddamn, basically what, every, what he did the rest of his career. And it got to the point where I couldn't fucking take it anymore, right? Meanwhile, um, Sean and Brett are getting worse because now Brett has come back. Sean's uh, career-ending knee injury didn't last that long. He's back. They're going to wrestle at uh, King of the Ring or SummerSlam, whenever the first one was planned. Then they get in the fight in Hartford where Brett jerked him around and pulled his hair out. Unsafe hey, work. Can, I, can I stop you right there, Jim? In the, yes. uh in the documentary that I was just on Viceland that I'm already forgetting the name of the uh, dark side of the ring. Excuse me. Yes. In dark side of the ring, when they showed the clump of hair being put on the table, was that an accurate representation of the size of the clump of hair? The real one was a little bit bigger. It just so you know, but anyway, um, at the same time as I had other duties, I was announcing, I was, I transitioned from on camera managing in 96 to announcing in 97. We did, the syndication show superstars with Jr. Um, and, and I also agented at the TVs. All that stuff was fine, but having to go to Vince McMahon's house and try to write with this guy <clears throat> when already it, it, when you're on the creative team for Vince, it's a lot of what ifs because you don't just book the wrestling that you would book if it was you. Vince tells you the main event of the pay-per-view. Vince tells you the programs between the top stars. Vince tells you the main event of Raw or, or, or the big stuff. And then you've got to pitch, well, okay, how do Brian and Jim get to that pay-per-view? Uh, does Brian come out and fuck Jim on TV out of something? Does then Jim come out and cut a promo and run the 605 Super Podcast down the next week? On What if they did this? What if they did that, right? So that's what you would do. And when Vince liked stuff, he'd say, okay. And sooner or later, you'd get a program out of it. <clears throat> so now there's, when it was, when it's me and Russo constantly sniping at each other, it's just torture. And also, then we have to worry about a champion and or a goddamn top star uh, opposing him, whether it's Brett or Sean. Sean is going to fucking crack up or Sean's going to do this or do that or whatever the fuck. So it, it, then... To, uh, on top of that, Vince has made the deal with Brett to get him back to, to not take the big money deal from WCW to take less money from WWF over a longer period of time. And then he says he, he wants to go back on it. And he tells Brett, no, wait, see if you can still get the deal from Bischoff. Right. I, I, <laughs> and we're hearing this and I'm going out of my mind. Right. 
because all of this is so stressful and it's so much more drama and bullshit than it needs to be. So anyway, um, by the time that, that October gets around and he's planning for this, I'm like, Vince, yeah, shouldn't you have taken the belt off Brett? We're going to do it. The survivor series. He'll drop it to Sean. You think? Oh yeah. October was also uh, the bad blood pay-per-view where Brian Pillman had died. And we've told that story before, but that was also the, the time where, you know, Shawn Michaels had to get out of the program with the undertaker. Right. So we uh, uh, fucking got that done with the introduction of Kane. And that was my, what ifs, that was one of my favorite, what ifs I had said, what if, you know, we had the cage like in Memphis where it's around the ringside and what if, cause nobody came through the ring in those days as a what if Kane debuts by jerking the door off like Kevin Sullivan did with Doug Furness in Knoxville Christmas night of 88 or whatever the fuck, right? And it came off. <laughs> so I was getting pretty good at Vince's what ifs. But anyway, if you want to go back and, and relive all of the details of the Sean and Brett fiasco leading up to Survivor Series, go back and read the observers because Dave had everything. It's all legitimate. He had He was talking to everybody. Um, everything that he wrote is correct in the issues the weeks after the fact, uh, when, you know, he reported all that stuff. So if you want all the details, but suffice it to say that the week before, and as a matter of fact, hold on, let me get my book out. <clears throat> it was November 5th, I believe I'm turning to the page. You hear me turning to the page. Those sound like actual pages. It was Wednesday, November 5th. It's the Wednesday before Survivor Series. For the last uh, previous few weeks, it's been just me and Russo with Vince. So not even a buffer of Bruce, just me and the other guy, right? And I dread going to these days. And this day especially, because it's the phone calls from Brett, the phone calls from Sean, and trying to get a finish. Friday night is a house show in Toronto. Brett can't drop it there if we change the match because, or change the card because it's in Canada. He don't want to lose in Canada. What about Detroit on Saturday night? We don't want to lose the night before Survivor Series because they've advertised a world title match. He don't want to disappoint the fans. <clears throat> Sean is, you know, at this point, will probably do whatever the fuck because he's supposed to win, right? But it, then the, Brett comes up with the idea what about if he just on raw the next night or they do a big schmoz at survivor series and on raw the next night, he just hands the belt over and gives a farewell speech. And I'm, what? Oh God. <clears throat> and every time that Vince goes back McMahon to take these phone calls, I'm sitting there left twiddling my thumbs, looking at Vince Russo and trying to make small talk. And it's driving me out of my mind. And at this point, I mentioned in the in the episode tonight, I'm almost 280 pounds. I'm aggravation eating. I'm this fucking shit's killing me. The locker room trying to write this shit with these people, trying to coexist with Russo. I'm grumpy. Everybody knows what happens when I get grumpy. Um, as well, it should be noted that previous to this, and hold on, I have my copy right here. <clears throat> Our old friend Scott Teal, who has since done some great history books on New York and Nashville, at the time, was doing whatever happened to, where he would interview the old timers, and, and it was a bulletin where he'd transcribe these interviews and, and old clippings. He had just reprinted, and it's the first time I'd ever had a chance to actually read it, the book The Fall Guys. Because I have my reprint right here, Wrestling Reprints number 1, September 1997, I had just gotten it, and over the previous few weeks, I was taking it on the road with me to fucking read to keep my sanity. So, Vince comes back in and says, we just can't work anything out. So, I'm frustrated, and I, at, at one point I blurted out, God damn it, uh, change the match, book him with Shamrock, he'll drop the belt. But that was a smart aleck comment. But I was thinking back to when Bearcat Wright had not wanted to drop the title of Fred Blassie in California. And so instead of Blassie coming out, out comes Judo Gene LaBelle. 
But obviously, Bearcat Wright just gets out of the ring, walks out, quits the promotion. They never had the match. Brett would have done the same thing. Besides that, Shamrock's friends with Brett, and we'd have been asking him to shoot on national TV. So we couldn't do that. <clears throat> but then, as whatever the fuck, finally I said, God damn it. And I remember saying this, and they kind of clipped it a little bit, but I said, God damn it, Vince, it's your belt. Take it back. Double cross him. And that's when, so Vince says, McMahon, this is all McMahon. Russo's sitting there with the buggy whip arms and a, you know, pie plate eyes, right? And Vince says, well, what should he do? Cinch up on a small package, which is the last double cross he did with Moolah and, and uh, Wendy Richter in 85. <laughs> and I just watched that not long ago, and God, did that look like shit. Because the referee was in on it because she didn't even really hold her down, and it was a mess, right? So I said, no, because if Shawn Michaels tries to cinch up on Bret Hart, then Bret will kick out and beat the fuck out of him on national TV, right? And so then Vince says, well, then how would you do it? Well, now it's a fucking challenge, right? He never does anything that I'm suggesting, <laughs> except for the hell in the cell thing. I got one the previous month, right? But I'd never get anything by so now, because we're getting nothing done anyway, he has dared me to come up with a fucking double cross. So since he ain't going to do it anyway, and it's better than listening to Russo talk, now I'm determined to come up with a double cross that would work. So and <clears throat> the one thing that I will give Russo in the episode tonight, they asked him, do you remember this conversation about the history lesson? No, because it wasn't a conversation. They would have cut me off after two minutes. I was thinking through this in my head. But double crosses, double crosses. What do I know about double crosses? It can't be the fucking deal that I mentioned, the cinch up. It can't be the fucking change the match. It can't be Don the Lawman Slatton and, and tape it from the fucking balcony. <laughs> um, <clears throat> a lot of double crosses in the old days... Gotch and Hack and Schmidt, Strangler Lewis, will do it the hard way, uh, the easy way or the hard way. That was predicated on the guy doing the double cross and it has to be able to legitimately beat the other guy, right? If you got a guy that can't legitimately beat the other guy, you have to have the referee in on it. Strangler Lewis and Henry DeGlaine, the battle of the bite. It's a centerpiece in the fall guys that I'd just been reading. I said, all right, we got to have the referee in on it. But how it, we, we, it can't be a fucking one, two, three. Back then, the tap out wasn't established, right? Remember, this was just the referee says, oh, you gave up. And you nod your head if you really want people to see it. Yeah. There was no tap out. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> so I said, all right, why would Brett, who's smart to the business and a wrestling family, he would be looking for something screwy. But at the same time, he really knows that Shawn Michaels probably can't make him submit. That's why, you know, he said he was wary about Earl counting him down, and he was wary about submission holds. Why would he get in that hold? Because that's another thing that the special did not make plain tonight. <clears throat> the spot was supposed to be that Shawn would get the sharpshooter on Brett, and then Brett would power out and do the babyface reversal and come up with a sharpshooter. And then the Hart Foundation would hit the ring. That's the spot he was given. That's why he let himself in it. But what I said was, figure out a way. We're in the finish. They're going home. Sean gets a sharpshooter on Brett. Brett's going to reverse it. But the referee rings the bell. You can't tell whether Brett said, I, I quit or not. And get the fuck out of there. Everybody gets out of there, right? Because the whole idea of a double cross is you're doing a finish to get a finish you want and not expose the business and not let anybody know anything was out of the way. So <clears throat> I said, have the referee ring the bell. When Brett's shocked, Sean scoots, gets the belt, go off the air and run. And then what the, and then my last word was, what the fuck's he going to do? Call the newspapers. <laughs> and of course that's exactly what he would do. But after I said that, Vince then, he gives this, mm, and this shrug sort of like, okay, back to reality when he wants you to stop talking about Gaga. And that's what he did. 
And then we went on with whatever the fuck else we did that day, right? I had come up with a double cross. And of course, he's never going to do it. So then the next day is November 6th. We were off. I was off from the office because I see here at two o'clock, I went to the dentist, got my teeth cleaned. And then <clears throat> Friday the 7th, I believe we had a day off because we were fixing to go on the road. And while the house show was in Toronto, the creative team, TV crew, et cetera, was still in Stamford. We were going to travel to Montreal on Saturday the 8th. While the house show was in Detroit on the evening of Saturday the 8th, the creative team, Vince, the television production, we all have a production meeting at the hotel in Montreal. <clears throat> I had driven because even then with the flying, right? But Montreal is only up 87, what, five hours from New York. So I'm going to drive this fucking loop and not have to fly to a foreign country. So anyway, we all gather at the uh, hotel on Saturday afternoon or evening for the production meeting. And they ran through the entire format, all the finishes, all the musics, everything. Get to the last uh, match and, okay, music, match, finish, ding, ding, off air. That's what Vince said. All right. <clears throat> so we're leaving and not like I wanted to prolong this. But I went up to him and I just leaned over and I said, Vince, do you have a finish for the main event? He said, yes. I said, good. That's all I need to know. And I went on back to the room and the next day, you know, the film crews following bread around and all the other shit. I had other matches to deal with, which I did. I wasn't involved in any way with any setting up of any of the uh, title match. Right. <clears throat> and I heard that they were going to do the run in because there's Owen and Davey standing by to do it. And basically because I'm already finished with anything I'm responsible for, but if you leave early, they get mad. I'm sitting by the monitor not at the gorilla position, but down uh, the one they set up for the boys, right? And I'm going to watch fucking match, and then as soon as it's over, I'm going to hop in the car. Well, then Vince goes out, right? And and takes did, would he take slaughter with him, I think? Anyway, I'm like, okay, that kind of adds to it. It's a little edgy because people are already wondering if they're going to get in a big fight. Sean and Brett, the smart fans are that existed then, are wondering what's going to happen. And so I didn't think too much about it. And Sean and Brett are having a great match. And then finally, I didn't know anything until I saw them going into that spot. And my, I shit myself because at that moment I realized he's going to fucking do this. He's going to fucking double cross him on fucking live television. And this is my finish. Right. And I'm like, Fuck certainly to God, not. And they do it. And, but Vince is saying, ring the bell. My finish was designed to get the fuck out of there. Nobody knows anything's wrong. Vince takes it completely the other way and calls attention to it and is forcing the issue. <clears throat> and as we'll talk about here in a few minutes, thought he was going to be the baby face. So I see that when the bell rings, I said, fuck, I don't know who knows that I had anything to do with this or what the fuck. I jump up, and like I said in the show, I go get in the car, and I beat fucking Hebner out of there. And, I, you know, that's, I was, all night, I'm like, what the fuck? When I show up tomorrow, is somebody going to want to beat my ass? And that, of course, the next day is when Cactus did no show. Of course, Owen and Davey did, but that's understandable, but Cactus did. And I get there, and Vince just, oh, Everything's going to be all right. We're going to have these meetings. We're going to do this. We're going to tell the talent and Cornette call Cactus Jack and get him to come back. I'm like, fuck. So he doesn't know this to this day until now. But when I called him and he was saying, I can't believe Vince double crossed one of the boys. I, it was my fucking finish. And I'm trying to talk him back into fucking coming back to work. Who did but, know? How many people did know that it was your finish? Me and me and the two Vinces. That's the only people that were in the fucking room. You ever said it to anyone else since then? Well, oh, I t told a few people after the fact, which we'll get into. Okay. But at that time, uh, that, that's uh, I didn't know because once again, <clears throat> Pat Patterson. I'm sorry for my voice, folks. Pat Patterson was the one who agented the match and probably told him the spot. But 
I don't think Pat really knew because Vince always protected Pat and he wouldn't have wanted to put him in that position, but it wouldn't have been unusual if for Vince to say, Hey, Pat, at least, you know, let's do this spot. Let's get it exciting. Let's and give him that spot and let him relay it right without telling Pat what was going to happen beforehand. I believe Bruce didn't know because he didn't need to know. Um, I, but uh, once again, until I got there the next day, I didn't know, you know, who had told what it, to who. So then I get there and, and nobody's yelling at me. So I'm like, okay. But once again, this is <laughs> my issue was twofold. Number one, I liked Brett and Sean was a prick. And it was only out of frustration that I came up with a fantasy scenario because I was dared to by the goddamn, you know, billionaire owner who was only a multimillionaire then. I didn't think he was actually going to do it. Secondly, inadvertently, much like finding out that my fan club president got Vince Russo in the business originally, me, who always wanted to uphold kayfabe and protect the business, is responsible inadvertently for the one finish that did more to expose the business than, than anything else in modern fucking history. So I, so I have lived with that guilt. <laughs> and honestly, that's why I didn't want to say anything because I'm like, what the fuck? What, it, it, this was just a goddamn, you know, a what if, but he did it. And then Vince thought he was going to be the good guy and he was going to go out there and say, Brett wouldn't honor the time honored tradition and all the people turned on him because it, 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 he came off like a heel. And they loved Brett. So that inadvertently led to Mr. McMahon, which inadvertently led to more exposing of the fucking business and, and all of the backstage gaga. It's Scott Teal's fault. <laughs> it's Scott Teal's fault. It's his fault. But anyway, so after that, and then, you know, within a few weeks, all the guys had settled down a bit and et cetera. But um, Jim Ross knew after the fact, cause I told him and I also, and we're probably going to try to talk to him. I told Dave Meltzer because <laughs> Dave was talking to everybody else and getting everything else. Right. That's the only way I was able to find out what the story was for the shit that I wasn't around for was by calling Dave Meltzer. But also I had called him when I was snooping around wanting to find out if anybody was mad at me. And since I had known Dave for 15 years, I knew that he would keep it in confidence if I explained it to him. And I did. And he has all this time. So, and then later on, Danny Davis knew about it, but uh, I did not bandy it quite a bit. And then <laughs> I got to say this Bolin years after the fact, star maker Bolin tried to, to claim on his show that I called him and told him before, you'll never guess what they're going to do. They're going to screw Brett tonight. Number one, I would have had to call from a pay phone because nobody had a cell phone then. And I wasn't going to call star maker Bolin <laughs> on a pay phone from Canada to tell him about a finish that I didn't know about. So, but Kenny's about as reliable as Bruce sometimes anyway. So <clears throat> that's what happened. And <sighs> And, you know, I want to save it until I've got more voice. But uh, as a matter of fact, maybe we can do that next week also. But uh, I, uh, the following month was basically my last month on the creative team. And I'll explain how that happened when I got more voice. Uh, but a as of this point, as of this day, I never brought it up to Vince again. And he never fucking made a comment to me again. We just looked at each other and never talked about it. It was like a goddamn mob hit. It was like the thing you do not discuss, but we know when we see each other. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, like I said, a month, uh, it was two weeks later that I came to Louisville for Thanksgiving vacation and met Danny Davis, uh, or ran into Danny Davis. I knew him so long and saw OVW and saw an escape hatch to get out of Connecticut. And that's when I went on my diet. I went from 280 in November of, of 97 to 198 in July of, of 99 when I moved to Louisville. I had something to live for again. And the following year, I'd gone back to thank, at, at Thanksgiving again, and that's when I worked his TV and worked with some of his guys. 
and talk to him about an idea for a developmental program and then start selling it to JR. So within that two or three month, two month period, October and November of 97, you know, the fucking chaos, trying to write that show, trying to write what Vince wanted, what the stars would do, the thing with Pillman. Then here comes this goddamn deal. Then I run into Danny and COVW and see a lifeline. And then I inadvertently give Russo the opportunity to Iggy me off the creative team, which was fine with me because I was making the same amount of money and I didn't have to look at him once a week. So, it, which there's a misconception that I'm mad about that. I was happy when I got that job and I was even happier when it was over with because I was still making the same amount of money and not sitting with him one day a week and not having to sit with the principal as well. That was all within October and November. And uh, from then on, my thing was just getting to Louisville and Russo's thing was, you know, that's when they brought Ferrari in. I was there for his audition. Jesus Christ. Because Ferrari liked to watch Jerry Springer too. So Bruce was in the office. I was doing third party stuff and the two numb nuts took over Vince's attention for a year and a half and hot shotted the thing to oblivion and we've still not recovered. But once again, that's the only thing I've never told before because I was halfway ashamed of it. I didn't want to screw Brett. Brett was the one I liked. I'd have loved to have screwed Sean, but he was not the one that was leaving. And to be honest, I'm sitting there in Connecticut, as I said, miserable, blah, blah, blah. And here's Brett's going to make 2.8 million and Sean's guaranteed 750 grand a year. And I'm going, fuck me. So it was frustration and a history lesson from fucking Scott Teal and his wrestling reprints that led to the Montreal screw job. I'm sorry to pop anybody's bubble if that's not as complicated a story as it needs to be. But I was challenged to figure a fucking finish. And that's what I do. These are the things I do. In The Observer, I wanted to ask you about one thing, because uh, Dave does a day-by-day breakdown of the original issue covering everything. November 8th, 97, there's this quote that I always found funny. At about the same time, the WWF Brain Trust was in Montreal one day early. Vince McMahon held a meeting at the hotel with Jim Ross, Jim Cornette, Pat Patterson, and Michaels. Reports- no, no, whoa. Here's the thing. <clears throat> Michaels came into the production meeting. But the the meeting was not just with those people. That was the production meeting. And Kevin Dunn was there. And if if there was another agent that wasn't in Detroit that night, they were there. And whoever was directing at that time, I can't remember, David Sahadi might have been. The, the main people in television, the main people in creative, it was a regularly scheduled production meeting. But Michaels came and sat in on it. Reports are that at least two of the aforementioned names looked extremely uncomfortable leaving the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was always uncomfortable when I went into those fucking meetings because I knew they were going to last three fucking hours and I'd already knew all this shit. Um, I did not report that because I wasn't caring about anybody else but myself. And and when we got out of there, I, that's why I asked Vince. I said, have you got to finish? And he said, yes, does it okay? And I went back to my room. But then I later found out from the observer, I think first, and then by asking, is this true? That that night, Jerry Briscoe was there. That's right, because Jerry Briscoe had gone into the hotel room with Shawn Michaels, trying to give him a crash course in fucking I'd, defending himself or shooting or whatever. the f- He tried to show him a few things. It was one of those deals that Vince would say. Vince would say, Gerald. Go show Sean a few things in case he has to take care of himself. Well, what the fuck? He's going to turn him into goddamn Carl Gotch overnight in a fucking hotel room? (laughs) But but that's the kind of thing that Vince would do. So, but that that happened. But I didn't know it was going to happen at the time. How often do you see Brett when you do your limited appearances each year? Well, you know, that's the thing. He was so nice. I saw him the last time in 2016. He was in England. When I when Jr. and I did that show, and I did the show with Kenny McIntosh, and he came out and guested, and when was great, and people loved seeing him. I I like Brett. I respect Brett. I used to think Brett took himself too seriously, 
But now that's refreshing. He took himself and the business seriously. And, and as opposed to the guys today that don't give a fuck about anything and just puke on each other, you know, but that's the worst thing I ever had to say about him. I loved his brother, Owen, the whole family's fucking, you know, it, nuts in a good way, just so colorful and et cetera. But it, you know, I even said they cut this out of the, the vice land thing. I said, God damn it. He wouldn't do anything else. I fucking pitched. He does this, this one thing, <laughs> uh, you know, so that once again, I never wanted credit for it, but <laughs> two things happen. Number one vice comes and says 20 years later, we're going to do a fucking national TV documentary and the behind the curtain deal with IDW. They, that's the one story they wanted to do. And I said, all right, if I was ever going to fucking say this, you know, it, now's the time. And, and it's covered in behind the curtain also with more detail on. And I, I gave the Viceland guys six hours of this history also, because, you know, the, the, the deal was that it was a revenge double cross on Lewis for double crossing the fucking guy. He double crossed when uh, Paul Bowser had put up the 70 grand, right. To have Gus Sonnenberg, the champion. Yeah. But then Sonnenberg got the shit kicked out of him on the street. So they switched it to Ed Don George without asking Lewis and, and Mont. So they will fuck you. So Lewis goes to get the belt back. It was constant double crosses in those days. I'd been reading that and I gave him the, but of course they're not going to go that deep into, at least Strangler Lewis was on TV tonight, right? At least we got that much, but they couldn't go into that detail, but that's the, that's the way wrestling worked. And Brett knew exactly what to look for. Watch his shoulders, talk to the referee, don't let him count him down. And if there wasn't a reason, <laughs> that's the thing about figure and finishes. It's not just, I'll do this to you and you do this to me. There was no reason for, for Shawn Michaels to ever put a submission hold on Brett Hart because he didn't use them. That wasn't his thing anyway. And Brett would have smelled it. But the idea of a spot where Oh, Sean gets your hold, but then you power out and reverse it. That was the enticement to get him in the thing to begin with. You have to, it's another reason why Russo's an idiot. He just said, oh, just slam bang, put the hold on him and ring the bell. <laughs> How are you going to talk Brett into getting in that fucking hold, you idiot? That's the reason why Vince Russo in WWF, TNA, or anywhere he's ever worked, never agented one match. He'd do the interviews, not the matches. He was never asked to and wouldn't if he if he was. Do you really he didn't know anything about it? Do you really have it in your will that <laughs> you're gonna piss on his grave? What did you say in the, in the documentary? I can't comment on ongoing legal documents. <laughs> I, I said if I'm incapacitated and unable to fucking do it on my own, Stacy is out of the will if she doesn't assist me to get there and do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please let me get the filming but, rights. <laughs> but anyway, but yes, but but and 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 if Brett is listening to this, and I don't know why he would be, because he's got more money than the federal government to this day, I'm sure, and doesn't need all this shit. But I, I do apologize. But once again, you know, if the fucking billionaire dares me to come up with a fucking finish, and and out of frustration and just not giving a shit. And, and just uh, being beaten up physically and mentally by the whole goddamn thing. When I get cranky, I uh, suggest shit like that. <clears throat> but that's uh, basically the story. And we will next week, we'll possibly have some comments from Mr. Meltzer. And also we will talk when I can talk more about my last month on the creative team and, and how happy I was when Russo iggied me out, but how that went about too which I've actually never really told that story either. And it was, and I've never to this day, Vince McMahon never told me you're off the creative team. I'll tease you with this. I, it, it's hard without telling the whole story, but I talked to Beth Vince's secretary and said, boy, have I missed that day? Is that okay? Cause we're up here doing this TV shoot. Sure. We'll call you 
and let you know when to come back. And they just never did. And I never mentioned it again. <laughs> I was like, every week I was like, I don't have to go to Vince's. I don't have to go to Vince's. You see, if this was WCW, you'd be getting a check for $125,000. Well, yeah, yeah. But they actually, that's why they're still in business. They ran a halfway fucking reputable business. Hey, I know we're not going to go much longer because obviously your voice can't hold up. But one question I did want to ask you, because one part of the documentary, I did think, oh, why even focus attention on this? But I'd like to get your thoughts is the idea of the conspiracy theory yes. that it was all work that everyone was in on it what are your thoughts on the conspiracy theory and just to <laughs> clear everything up to the best of your knowledge and obviously you were on the inside here who actually knew what was going to happen in the ring that night right before that it was going to happen let's go to that okay um well first of all and, and they use scott hall I, I i talked to the producers and they said well we it's out there that that opinion is out there so we wanted to have somebody represent it and you know if scott genuinely believes that then then he should discuss with one of his best friends for the past 25 years the fact he's been lying to him for 20 fucking years or else why is he was just saying that to get more camera time but it, it anybody who thinks that it was it, nothing that is is scripted works out that well <laughs> ain't that the truth <laughs> yeah. so so that's just completely ridiculous and what was the second part of your question who actually knew i mean who oh. were the actual people that knew the double cross was going down before it went down well i i don't know for sure everybody but i can tell you that sean had to know and he's admitted it uh i think he probably told triple h hebner in the manner in which he was he just related on the show was told very shortly beforehand. Jerry Briscoe had to know because he was doing the workout deal. Vince knew. I, once again, I genuinely believe that Pat and or Bruce, neither one knew because Vince would protect them from, from being in that position. Shane McMahon was there that day. Would he, he would have um, known too then. I, I bet you Shane was not at that point was not, you know, as important as he is now in the company, he was just starting at that time. He'd just gotten out of college, but probably Vince probably said, Hey, this is what we're going to do. So, and <laughs> that's the thing, the punch, the whole nine yards in the locker room, that was a real deal because Vince went to take the fucking shot that he knew Brett was going to give him. He felt like he owed him that. Now you didn't, um, you didn't know they were going to use your finish, but did you know the double cross was going down before it went down? No, that's what I'm saying. I thought it was a fucking run in DQ too. So Cause I'm did. seeing the, I'm seeing bulldog and Owen at the gorilla position waiting to run in. Okay. They're going to do this bullshit DQ, but they're going to have this big fight and act like it got unprofessional. And the first time that I realized that it was going to be what it was, was when they did the spot where Sean started. And as Brett showed you, he had to get into it himself because Sean didn't know how to do it. But when they were doing that for a second, I was like, Oh, they're not. Oh, they are though. Like, oh shit. And once he got in it, I said, oh, this is, this is it. That's when I knew. So I, I don't know what more to say um, at this point. <laughs> well, we could keep going, but just uh, I guess we kind of exposed it earlier. This is now late at night on Wednesday. Yes, it's we midnight, and I've been talking to people all day, and I'm still not back in my form. But I apologize to Brett. I apologize more to uh, – I helped kill Fabe. And see, that was the thing. Afterwards, Brett was so upset about it, and and looking in hindsight, rightfully so. And by the uh, also, if we'd have bothered to sit there for another thirty minutes and talk about what he would think about after we did all this, we probably wouldn't have done it. But since it was, I was dared to come up with a double cross that would hold water. I did. Vince blew it off. We continued, and never talked about it again. I certainly didn't give it the thought that well, you know, probably in twenty years, Brett's still going to be mad. Maybe we shouldn't ought to do that. <laughs> but Vince uh, apparently thought, but, but once again, he took it the other way. He let everybody know what he had done rather than trying to kayfabe it from everybody. So it completely changed the complexion of the thing. And, you know, Brett's calling the newspapers, Brett's going on TV. It was, you know, yes, billionaire, Mr. McMahon was the greatest heel character of all time. And yes, they entered a golden period. But when we peeled so much of the curtain back, it, it you couldn't go back from those things. And now, after the hot shotting, they never have gone back after all those things. But so once again, like I said, 
my finish on a dare led to more exposing of the business as a work and the behind the scenes manipulations of same than anything else that's ever been done. So I, I bear this shame. Maybe somebody should piss on my grave. Well, tune in next week when Jim talks with our guest, Eddie Mansfield. About- oh, shut up. <laughs> God damn you. <clears throat> but anyway, we, we will, we will try to uh, talk more about that that following month, which is interesting also, and et cetera, when I have more voice. Uh, Hold on, one more thing I have to ask. And all right, we well, go ahead. I'm, I'm burying my soul here. One more question. Just on this topic that you came up with this finish, they ended up using the finish to your surprise, and you've kept it inside, other than a few people who have known about it. You haven't said anything. Is it something you've been dying to say? Is it something you've wanted to say? Hey, no. Um, <laughs> not that you're proud of it, because obviously you're not proud that well, no, you finished and see, Seth, but you know what I mean. But no, here's the thing that when I've I've skirted with the issue before, because I never I never try to take credit for it or try to even really tell a story until everybody else did. And I, somebody said Sean came up with the idea. Well, yeah, like Sean Michaels talked Bret Hart into getting in his own fucking thing, right? Um, then, but the biggest thing was dipshit, shit stain. When he was, well, I told him and he put it in his book and he said, I just, just have him put his hold on and ring the bell. What are you fucking moron? That's what you think wrestling is. Just tell these trained monkeys to just do this. And how are you going to get to that point? Vince McMahon, the best negotiator in history of wrestling, couldn't talk these guys into a fucking finish, right? You're going to, you fucking moron. But so I just, I've tried to tell people when people were blatantly lying without admitting the whole truth. But at this point, like I said, 20 years, a TV documentary, the graphic novel, if it's not now, it's never. And it just to set the goddamn record straight because it was once again, I said, nothing that's written ever comes out this good. You can't, even though this broke kayfabe, it actually, to me, perpetuated the idea that the things that will draw the most money that people will believe in most are the things that are real. Because this was real. It was just a byproduct of this real thing that we had to expose kayfabe. <laughs> because if Brett didn't really lose the belt and he didn't really win the belt, then by extension, all other things in wrestling were work but this. But because this was real, it got everybody's attention and drew money. It, it's a goddamn, it's a conundrum wrapped in an enigma. And it doesn't make any fucking sense. And and wrestling has been trying to work, shoot, shoot, work ever since then. Everything else we've ever done is phony, but this is real this week. Just like it was two weeks ago, last time we said that. It's all off of this. It just, it led us down a slippery slope and a primrose path to fucking bullshit and gaga. And now it's hollow down ice in a fucking wrestling ring. This was the start of that. So I'm obviously not proud of it. And like I said, I'm sorry, Brett, but fuck, it, it wasn't my call. You know, but don't dare me to come up with a fucking finish. But that, but you know, that's just so to answer your question, no, I've never really wanted to come out. I just wanted to come out and tell people when people were lying, but then I wouldn't tell the whole truth. And then it wasn't as great as of, of a uh, statement as it could be about these people are full of shit because, well, how do you know? Well, here's the true story. I wasn't telling a true story. So I don't know, whatever the fuck. Once Brett signed the deal with WCW and you knew he was leaving, what was Vince's reaction when anyone would suggest have him drop it to anyone other than Sean, who he hates more than anything in the world? Have him drop it to anyone what? else. Because it seems like if, you know, every Vince scenario was get it on Sean, get it on Sean. And we, we're not, we don't have to go into the whole his reliability, right, his drug right. issues and everything. But just in terms of if that's the issue with Brett, get it on Undertaker, get it on Shamrock, get it on someone. What was Vince's reaction when he would hear a suggestion for someone other than Sean? Well, that's the thing. By that point, it was too late. It was, it was like they'd already announced the match. <laughs> he, he, and, and besides that, I think Vince would have been admitting defeat if he switched it. And he'd have set a bad precedent with the boys 
oh, you don't want to drop the belt to this guy? Well, we'll change the match and you can drop it to the guy you want to drop it to. He'd be setting a precedent. And I think he'd be admitted. And, and Vince McMahon Sr.'s cardinal rule that Vince Jr. would repeat on numerous occasions, get the match in the ring. The guy's holding you up on the big show, the stadium, whatever. Get to match in the ring. Give him what he wants and then fuck him afterwards. Or just get rid of him afterwards or whatever the fuck. Get the match in the ring. And I think he was trying to do that. And, I mean, once again, remember, he's still the boss, and I was not as abrasive then as I am now, but I couldn't just come out and say, God damn it, Vince. Why didn't you fucking take the belt off of him two months ago before you reneged on his contract? But I wanted to constantly, Vince. Why didn't you fucking take the belt off of him two months ago before you told him you were reneging on his contract? It, 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 see, that's another thing. It's another murder mystery that the creative team was asked to help finish when they didn't start it. <laughs> Vince McMahon would tell you who got killed, who the killer was, and what the location was, and then say, okay, go write the book. And that that's what the creative test. So in this case, he said, okay, I want uh, Brett to drop the title to Sean. Uh, but Brett don't want to, and he's got creative control in his contract that I signed for the last 60 days. And, oh, by the way, you know, uh, I didn't bother to have him drop the belt before I told him that I wasn't going to pay him the money I agreed to, and he can go get his other deal back if he can still get it from Bischoff. And we'll we'll work Bischoff. Because that, that was the thing. He said, just say you've got a loophole. Say you've got an out. We'll write it in a clause that you can send to him, and then you t see if you can still get the fucking deal from Bischoff. Vince was going that far to work with Brett to get him out of the deal that he signed for him a fucking not even a year earlier. And then, when you know who won the pony, the company turned around in the next six months after they fucked Brett, and he could pay him just fine. And by the way, the Bischoff, <laughs> for everything bad we could say about Bischoff, and there's good and bad to say about him, obviously. It seems like this is one scenario where he kind of handled everything well. Where he yeah, kind of oh. let everything play out. He just sat back. He said, I got him under contract. You need an extra week? You can have an extra week. So originally, the plan yes. was Brett was going to stay with the WWF until December. Yeah, and the, well, at one point, one of the suggestions was that he stay until the December pay-per-view and drop it in some kind of four-way deal or whatever. Yeah. in December and, and so get a 30 day extension that was right in there late in the game before he came up with the idea of just relinquishing it on raw and Bischoff would agree to that. But here was the thing. <clears throat> and I'm glad you brought that up because this is important that people understand. People have said, Oh, Brett was going to go and throw the garb uh, the belt in a garbage can or was going to show up on Nitro the next night live or was going to this or that. No, he wasn't. And Well, no, he wasn't. And Meltzer has pointed out that they uh, set established legal precedent with the belt. You couldn't have the belt. It was intellectual property, blah, blah, blah. But uh, And Dave was taking the piss out of some of it because uh, some people were still perpetuating the idea that this was what was going to happen. Vince McMahon did not ever believe that Bret Hart was going to show up on live TV or throw the belt in a garbage can or do anything other than what he said he was going to do as far as Bret showing up on WCTWTV. Here was the fucking issue. The issue was, because back in those days, there was, the internet was not a thing. And the only way that you could communicate instantly the wrestling promotions was on live TV. <laughs> Vince was going to be live on Sunday night. Bischoff was going to be live on Monday night. The question in Vince's mind was, I can trust Brett not to do any of these things, but can I trust Eric Bischoff not to come out and say, ladies and gentlemen, we have signed the current WWF champion, Brett Hart. He's going to be here in 31 days. It was because Vince didn't trust Bischoff not to reveal the news because that would have been the same. If, if and this was still wrestling in those days, if even if Brett had come out on TV the next night, which he wouldn't, but even if Bischoff had said on TV the next night, we've signed Bret Hart after he lost the belt, it would look like, Oh, the guy lost the belt. He's fucking mad. He's leaving. He's going to another place. Whatever. Right. But when you have signed the other company's current world champion, 
You have fucked that guy's wife right in front of him on television. You have kicked that guy's dog. You have emasculated him. You have made him your bitch in the wrestling world in those days. And that's what Vince was trying to forestall, avoid, whatever the fuck. He did not trust Brett, but he didn't trust Bischoff with his company in his hands. He was given... Uh, he would have been put in the WWF's, not necessarily future, but definitely their public image in the hands of Eric Bischoff. He would have been the ultimate fucking, <laughs> Vince would, saw that, I'm sure, as being Bischoff's bitch. He can't let somebody else have that much power over him. He had to do something that night. He might get Brett, but he's not getting my champion. And that's why he, I, I believe in hindsight, that's why he did what he did. He took... <laughs> and it could have been that day because like Bruce said, Vince McMahon can talk you into doing all kinds of shit. You never would have walked into that room intending to do right. And it may have been till that day when Vince said, I can get this some way I can get this in the ring. I can get it, whatever. And then when he realized that he couldn't, he had already made the fucking backup plan the night before with Jerry Briscoe and the fucking shoot wrestling lesson. I'm sure that was like Billy Robinson coaching, you know, good Lord, <laughs> but he probably, he had that said, okay, if all else fails, we'll do it. I guess. Cause once again, I never brought it up again. We never mentioned it. He didn't either to this day, but that, <laughs> But now you've That's, claimed your spot in the history books <laughs> that I didn't want. That you didn't want. That I didn't want. But <clears throat> Danny Davis used to call me the weasel in OVW because I would weasel my way out of whatever corner they painted me in when they brought my feuding program, Heel and Babyface, up as a tag team. When they pulled this guy or they sent that guy or they changed this guy's name or they put a mask on Matt Morgan, I would figure out logical finishes or ways to explain it on interviews or things that were, it just didn't hang there because of my OCD. I have to, you know, the details, right. And one of the things I've been able to do from learning from all of these guys, Bill Dundee and Bill Watts, Dusty Rhodes, whatever, there's a way to do a finish for anything. If you, if you, and, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad, whatever. But there's a finish for everything. And finishes, like I said, are not just you do this to me and I'll do this to you and then you hit that big move. You're planting seeds. You're telling a story. You're making things make sense. And logically, even to a fan who doesn't really know the behind-the-scenes business, but when they're watching it, nothing pops out at, at that fan as slaps you in the face with it's uncharacteristic or it shouldn't be there. Or that you don't follow a shooting with a stabbing. The big cross body that gets the huge pop, and then you go two more minutes because that's what you had figured, right? You build these things. You put things in the right places. I've been good with finishes, sometimes to my detriment. But there you have it. And I, I would be interested in feedback. if <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, or death threats, whatever. Uh, yeah, what but, about that? In the uh, middle of the documentary, all of a sudden they have to have you show one of the death threats you've received on the wall? Well, no, they shot here for six hours. We did stuff for, for several of their specials on different subjects, and they asked me to give them a tour around the vault. And so I was just showing them some things, but they were they were somewhat fascinated by my, you know, dive into history because, you know, they uh, even Evan Husney, who's the producer we had on the show here, He's been a longtime wrestling fan, but I don't think he knew just how much history there was in the business to the backstories of things and why things are the way they are. And like I said in the in the program, you can learn from history because it always repeats itself. And it didn't even dawn on me that it was Montreal until after the whole thing happened. That was just an odd side note that both those things happen in Montreal, Lewis and DeGlaine in 31 and Michaels and Hart in 97. But that makes it a kind of a cool story that there were two Montreal screw jobs and one of them instigated the other one. And Scott Teal was involved too. God damn you, Scott. <laughs> no, I like the fact that they got your death threat in and also they made sure to make some space in the documentary for Brett to say that Tammy was sleeping with Sean. Well, yes, but it, and well, he winked when he said it, but when that, that, 
that ground has already been covered or that row has already been plowed or whatever you <laughs> how what old adage you want to use um you could use whatever old adage you want <laughs> <laughs> oh shut all right at least i got you at midnight i i can barely talk and you're a fucking babbling mess um <laughs> we we could do this all night and it seems like we already have but um folks i hope i sound better this weekend uh, when we or the, this coming Monday, when we do the drive through and next week on this program. Uh, but I just need some fucking rest. I'm, I'm too busy being irrelevant and changing the course of wrestling history. All right. Uh, there you have it. Should your... we close this fucking thing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought that was your sign off. Actually, for a second. <laughs> I was like, what an interesting way to end the show this week. All right. We'll, we'll be back uh, with more as soon as I can speak. And I apologize to the people that are mad at me. And if you don't believe what I said, fuck you and all the rest of us can have a happy, uh, good night. Good night. <laughs>